The Dark Knight is celebrating its 14th anniversary this summer, and with the release of the Batman earlier this year, it's safe to say we now have two indelible, grounded incarnations of Gotham's favorite vigilante. Both of these movies absolutely slap. The Dark Knight is, at its heart, a crime film of the cops and robbers mindset, while The Batman is a more intimate crime film for the majority of its runtime as he tracks down a serial killer, with the mob playing a prominent role in the background of both. Dark Knight is a film that starts with the Mafia as its biggest problem before it becomes obvious that the Joker could ultimately be Gotham's tipping point. Meanwhile, the Batman goes in the opposite direction, starting smaller as Batman tracks a sadistic serial killer known as the Riddler, before he's exposed to the truth that the mob and corruption are the biggest issues facing the city. While The Dark Knight is set atop the superhero mountain is not only the best superhero movie ever made, but an all-time classic crime film along the lines of the best of Scorsese and Michael Mann, it now has an incredible counterpart in The Batman, a film that takes an even darker approach to crime drama than The Dark Knight, but just as satisfying in its own right as it draws from neo-noir crime cinema. You can definitely argue that the Batman owes a lot to Dark Knight. I mean, if these two scenes don't give you a sense of deja vu, I don't know what to tell you. But that's because both movies take from similar source material. What separates them is where they get their film aesthetics and story structure from. Both of these movies are so damn good, I'm not going to try and tell you which one of them is the best. I'll watch either one of them any day of the week. And that speaks to Dark Knight's longevity, that I can watch it for the millionth time and still go, Fucking yeah! Woo! And the Batman is on its way considering it's Lord of the Rings level runtime. I fucking love these movies! While they share the title of crime cinema, they're very much their own. Not quite comparing apples to oranges. It's not. It's the same ballpark. Ain't no fucking ballpark neither. But they're both fruit. So let's go. First, the shared source material. The Long Halloween is an epic crime noir and at this point a well-known comic book in popular culture. And there's a reason for that. It's one of the best Batman stories ever told. From the art style to its crime saga roots and use of multiple Batman villains, it's a now classic graphic novel. And a crime saga the story is indeed. It's now served as a major source of inspiration for The Dark Knight as well as The Batman, with both films taking different aspects of the story and applying them to their own scripts and visual styles. If you're familiar with the comic book and both of the films, it might seem at first like The Dark Knight takes more from Long Halloween than The Batman. But let's take a look. Dark Knight's heaviest influence from Long Halloween is its take on Harvey Dent, who in both the film and comic started off as the White Knight district attorney before inevitably being beaten down by corruption and turned into Two-Face. In the film, the Joker is the one who's responsible for Harvey's disfigurement, and in the comic, it's Sal Maroney. But Harvey's character arc in both is a fall from grace. Not just story beats, but scenes in the film are lifted straight from the comic too, like Joker burning the mob's money. In the graphic novel, Gordon and Batman do it. And while the Batman draws a lot of material from the graphic novel White Knight, it undoubtedly has its roots in Long Halloween. The comic itself is clearly influenced by noir films in both visual aesthetic and its writing, and the Batman almost gleefully takes from that, as he's seen doing a lot more detective work in that movie than in other films. And Riddler in the Batman is a replacement for the holiday killer in Long Halloween, both of whom leave cryptic clues and riddles for Batman to solve. Heavy mob elements and dirty cops from the comic are present in both films, as Mafia Dons Maroney and Falcone play key roles in Dark Knight and the Batman, and both films touch on the corruption prevalent within the Gotham PD. And while the movies are visually separated, they both somehow manage to take from the same source material and create something unique. Long Halloween is described by Nolan as fantastically noirish. The comic uses minimalism and shadows to make it feel exotic and bring a sense of realism, something both films attempt to do in their own ways. The Batman uses darkness and shadows to a beautiful extreme, while Dark Knight takes Long Halloween's sense of realism and blue color palette. To quote Nolan on Long Halloween, it's a crime epic. You're goddamn right. Just as The Dark Knight and The Batman are both crime films, but you certainly wouldn't confuse them, you wouldn't confuse the two films they take from, either. Dark Knight is heavily influenced by Michael Mann's Heat, and in my previous video about The Batman, I discussed at length how it took from David Fincher's neo-noir classic Seven. I also mentioned in my previous video that the mixing and matching of genres is how to inject a fresh take on a stale genre and subvert expectations. And the superhero genre is not only where you can get away with that kind of cinematic thievery, it's where mixing and matching shines. While the mob is present in The Dark Knight, it takes much more of a hint from Heat in the cops and robbers sort of way. Heat's protagonist is Lieutenant Vincent Hanna, a brilliant police officer and detective who's hunting the equally brilliant criminal mastermind Neil McCulley, who has a specialized crew committing heists of all sorts. Bank trucks, bank vaults, if it's got bank in the name, shit's getting robbed. While you definitely wouldn't confuse Joker with McCulley, the opening bank heist is eerily reminiscent of Heat's opening heist scene, and is strikingly similar to the bank heist that closes Heat's second act. 
Gotham City looks a whole lot like Michael Mann's Los Angeles, a far cry from the gothic aesthetic of previous films. It looks and feels like a real American city, shot similarly to how Michael Mann's cinematographer captured LA. Much like Heat, Dark Knight's aesthetic is heavy on blue tones and has a beautiful mix of still shots with hand cam used to bring that sense of grit and boots on the ground visual storytelling. There's so much happening in The Dark Knight. The pacing of the film is so rapid fire you don't get a chance to hold your breath. And Heat's similar where there's a sense of urgency at all times. Even in calming moments, there's a sense of dread underneath each scene. And as you've probably heard by now, The Batman has a lot of things in common with the movie Seven. Maybe more than just things in common. Like The Dark Knight, it lifts a lot of elements from its crime movie counterpart to its own benefit. I went over some of this in my initial video essay on The Batman, so I'll try not to retread ground. But Seven is a neo-noir classic, a 90s film through and through, and I mean that as a major compliment. It follows two detectives as they investigate a serial killer relating each of his victims to one of the seven deadly sins. Much like John Doe in Seven, who leaves clues and antagonistic messages behind to challenge our protagonists, the Riddler leaves behind riddles and ciphers to challenge Batman and drop hints of who his next victim will be. Just like Dark Knight, you can tell what kind of elements the Batman takes from its cinematic counterpart. From general aesthetic and tone, right down to certain scenes, the Batman feels like Seven molded into a superhero film. And again, I mean this as a major compliment. Batman could very well be a stand-in for Detective Mills, the more hot-headed of the two detectives, and Gordon could very well be Somerset. The very first Riddler crime scene is similar in lighting, color, mood, camera movement, and editing to Mills and Somerset's first crime scene investigation. This scene also takes place on Halloween night, linking us back to source material inspiration as the long Halloween's opening takes place on All Hallows' Eve too. Gotham itself is haunting, almost alive in how putrid it's portrayed in some scenes. You almost feel dirty walking through Gotham, and it's the same for the unnamed city in Seven that's clearly a stand-in for Los Angeles. The Batman pushes its PG-13 rating to the edge, showing the horror of the aftermath of Riddler's actions. Despite its rating not being able to show as much as Seven does, Matt Reeves' brilliant directing makes sure it's still a visceral experience. The opening of The Dark Knight and The Batman also mirror their respective film counterparts. Dark Knight follows Heat's lead in an opening scene, while The Batman follows Seven's. And those openings are definitely opposite of one another. In Dark Knight's case, it introduces its antagonist. The Batman, its true opening showcases its protagonist. Both films' first images are of its villain, but I'd argue that the Batman's real opening is the introduction of the city and Batman himself. Similar to how Seven begins by following Mills and Somerset, while he and Dark Knight prominently follow those films' antagonists, and two now-classic opening heist scenes. Yeah, Riddler's attack is the very first thing we see in the Batman, but the movie's big aha opening is most definitely Robert Pattinson's introduction as Batman. An incredibly visceral scene that showcases his seemingly unwavering brutality, the likes of which we hadn't seen on screen before. Prior to him stepping on the scene, you get a sense of Gotham as a living, breathing entity unto itself, something that could consume its inhabitants. This builds up Batman's intro as a figure of the shadows, something he uses to intimidate people, to make them think he could be anywhere at any time. And to connect again, similar to the Long Halloween's use of shadows. Filmmaking has come a long way over the decades, and long credits to start a movie are incredibly uncommon today. The Riddler opening is similar to Seven's opening credits, establishing a sense of dread, while its big opening scene is Mills and Somerset's first crime scene, introducing them how the Batman introduces the Dark Knight himself. Dark Knight's opening is that incredible bank heist, and the movie being a sequel, its benefit is that it gets to really showcase its villain, the Joker. This is similar to Heat, where the opening isn't of our hero Detective Hannah, but of our antagonist Macaulay. Both openings inform the viewer just how clever, intelligent, and dangerous they are. Dark Knight and the Batman couldn't be more different in the way they approach their characters either. What I mean to say is, just like Heat is Macaulay's movie, Dark Knight is most definitely Joker's movie. You can argue this point because Al Pacino's Hannah gets co-billing with De Niro's Macaulay, and Batman is in the title of his own movie, but face facts. In these films, it's the villain's world that we're living in. And I'm definitely not trying to say Joker and Macaulay are similar in demeanor or integrity. Macaulay has morals. He's quiet and far more stoic, while the Joker is, well, you know. <laughs> but the two films have a lot in common in how they handle their villains. I mean, shit, we're practically rooting for Macaulay to get away, even though Al Pacino's Hannah is undeniably fun. Don't waste my motherfucking time! Bon voyage, motherfucker. Okay, motherfucker! Here she got out. Great ass! That's what's so damn good about the movie, is you know De Niro's Macaulay is the bad guy, but you still don't want him to get caught. Similarly, the Joker is so engaging, so undeniably fun to watch on screen, so unpredictable that we don't want to stop seeing what he'll do next. 
I wouldn't say we're rooting for him, but I wouldn't have complained about another hour of Joker's mayhem. We even get similar conversations between our heroes and villains. Hannah finally meets Macaulay face to face, and it ends up being one of the greatest scenes in cinema history. The scene is so historic that where it was shot is now a landmark in LA. Similarly, when Batman and Joker finally have their first true conversation, it's cinematic gold and equally iconic. As a film fan, it might even be more iconic, even more memorable. In both films, we get to go back and forth about who has the upper hand. Hannah or Macaulay, Batman or Joker. Just as Seven's opening makes it clear that this is Mill's story, the Batman's opening makes it clear this is Batman's story. In the meta, this is the first time in a long time that Batman's got to be the main focus of his own movie. It's arguable that 2012's Dark Knight Rises refocused on our hero, but hell, it was more of a Bruce Wayne story than Batman's. This is most definitely the Caped Crusader's tale. I mean, he's in the bat suit the majority of the movie. In Seven, Mills is clearly the main character, a young, more brash detective who isn't as clear-headed as his older counterpart, Detective Somerset. Sound familiar? Seven ends tragically while the Batman is a setup for the Dark Knight's growth, but the through line of a younger, brazen detective? It's all right there. Just as the good guys of Heat and Seven are detectives, so too is the hero of Dark Knight and the Batman. I think people forget that Bats does do detective work in Dark Knight. It's just easily forgotten at this point because the Batman had his detective side as the primary focus for the majority of the movie. In the Batman, it's obvious. Batman is absolutely brilliant, with some plot conveniences helping him out at some points, but generally it's his intellect guiding him through solving puzzles and figuring out what Riddler's clues lead to. What gets lost in Dark Knight is Batman trying to keep up with Joker's hints and clues. Take a look at the scene with Batman at Joker's latest crime scene. The movie is a much larger crime saga in scale, so it doesn't have time to focus on this part of his skill set as much. But I remember when I first saw the film and greatly appreciated that they started down the path of him actually doing detective work. The film was even praised for it at the time. That aspect is just overshadowed now by the detective noir greatness of the Batman. If I'm being honest, the biggest difference here is the utilization of plot conveniences. Yes, even the best films have plot conveniences at times, it's just a matter of if they make or break the movie, which they don't in either case. In the Batman, Bats is using his intellect and, while they're surreal, at least is using plausible tools to help him. In the scene with the shattered bullet in Dark Knight, he does happen to have a pretty incredible MacGuffin. A machine that digitally reconfigures bullet fragments so that he can get the fingerprint from the original bullet and move the plot forward. Convenient. <laughs> Still awesome as fuck though, so. Both films also feature the Mafia, but in entirely different roles. Salvatore Moroni and Carmine Falcone are characters featured in both films, and both are prominent but do different things. Carmine is already in jail once Dark Knight begins, and it focuses on Moroni. Whereas the Batman prominently features Falcone as the face of the Mafia, with Moroni mentioned as his rival. How the mob is utilized in context of each story is in relation to how each movie treats its main villain. In the Batman, the mob is seen as part of the issue, with Riddler taking center stage as the person Batman's after. What Riddler does, however, is expose the true corruption of Gotham to Batman, who comes to understand that while obviously Riddler's actions are despicable, he has a lot more work to do than simply deal with one single person. It's the sadistic nature of Gotham and the apathy of the city that created him in the first place, and it's the city and its underbelly that Batman really has to wrestle with. The Dark Knight works the Mafia into its story in an almost completely opposite way. At the start, Batman is on the verge of eradicating the mob from Gotham for good. The Mafia is at first center stage in the story. Bats, Gordon, and Dent are on the verge of victory when the mob hires the Joker to kill Batman, and it doesn't become apparent until it's almost too late that Joker is a far, far bigger threat than the mob ever could be. And when relating them back to Heat and Seven, this makes sense. Heat has a detective who's solving a number of problems the city's throwing at him before he begins focusing on McCully. Seven focuses on its sadistic killer before an ending revelation that there's a greater problem. The world's apathy. The attitude of that city that created such a sadistic person. I absolutely love both of these movies, and I can't sing their praises enough. In my opinion, Batman works best alone. No Justice League, no Boy Wonder, none of the other baggage. He works best as a down-to-earth character, someone as close to the real world as we can get on film. Placing him in a grounded crime drama is where he functions best, at least on film, and I think audience reaction and appreciation speaks to that. Not to say he can't work in the greater, more fantastical elements of a Justice League film, but we, well, haven't seen that yet. Through. The Dark Knight and the Batman have atmosphere, mood, brilliant acting, incredible storytelling, and a beautiful aesthetic. How can you go wrong watching a movie featuring not just one of the best acting performances of all time, but one of the greatest screen villains ever in Heath Ledger's Joker? How can you go wrong watching one of the most beautiful looking films in recent memory with Matt Reeves' steady hand in cinematography? The Dark Knight might be part of the Justice League, 
but I'll stick with my solo Crime Saga Batman movies for now. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. And until next time, GG's only.